Hello, and welcome to Partially Redacted, a podcast where we discuss data privacy, engineering, security, and related topics. I'm your host, Sean Falconer, and today I'm joined by the head of security and compliance at Skyflow, Daniel Wong, and we'll be discussing SOC 2 compliance, audits, and reports. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sean. It's my great pleasure to be here. Yeah, so you are actually our first ever repeat guest. So you're back, I guess, by uh, popular demand. Uh, and so we'll skip the introductions. If you uh, haven't heard uh, Daniel's first episode, I definitely recommend that you go back and, and check that out. Uh, we talked about the common mistakes that companies make when it comes to security. Uh, I'll sh- link that in the show notes. But one of the things that we talked about when you joined us before was the fact that you have over uh, 50 patents related to database security. And I thought maybe before we jump into all the details around SOC 2, I wanted to talk, you know, revisit those patents and what are some of the patents that you actually hold in database security? Thank you, Sean. Those were the days that uh, I was doing a lot of R&D work. It was the earlier stage of my career. I basically spent many years at a leading um, database company focused on data security. Um, we spend many time, our customers were three data agencies and large enterprise customers. So our focus was to leverage the database, database platform, platform to, uh, to address many of the security needs. Uh, naturally, from the database vendor's perspective, the database is where the data is. This is the source of the data. So it makes sense to protect data by the source. So uh, I spent a lot of time with my team to do a lot of investigation into how we can really leverage database technologies. Database has backup recovery transaction, undo, redo logs, and uh, you know, and all the different queries you can do things. So super interesting. So uh, many of the patterns that we did, they were covering um, how to extend the database to provide fine-grained security, fine-grained application security, um, encryption technologies, auditing technologies, I'm glad to report that many of those have become common offerings from different uh, database vendors already. I've seen it from, uh, well, I would just, I would not name names, but there are many ones from different companies already. I'm pretty excited that, you know, those work that we did earlier were able to benefit many folks. And, um, and, uh, I would recall some of the interesting ones even now. I mean, the now that paradigm has changed. Now we're more cloud based, more distributed. Those days were more like database was the platform. So, you know, all of these are public now. So I think some of the interesting ones we even talked about, these say threat detections in the cloud. Those days, database was the cloud. And, uh, you know, we were investigating how do you have good threat detections at database level, right? Threat prevention at database level. There are many interesting things that we did. So um, the good old days, and I just want to be super happy about the work done. Yeah, Yeah, it's really really cool that, a lot of the work that you sort of did, you know, earlier in your career that you pioneered has has now found its way into, uh, you know, a variety of different uh, databases that are still being used today. So it's uh, it you've survived essentially that that those insights and those inventions that you created in the on prem world of of yesteryear have survived into the cloud era of today. Thank you. It was indeed a very interesting and exciting days. Yep. All right, so um, we're talking about SOC 2 compliance and sort of what it takes to achieve it. Uh, I think this is something that you know people hear all the time about SOC 2, uh, and you know it's often a requirement from a security standpoint to work with certain types of companies. But I think still think unless you're in the security space or you've gone through a SOC 2 audit before. Not everybody necessarily knows what it really means. So maybe we could start off with having you explain what is SOC 2 compliance and why is it important for certain types of businesses to actually achieve it? Yes. Thank you, Sean. Um, a SOC 2 report basically is an attestation by a, a basically a CPA, a, uh, you know, a certified auditor that, uh, about the organization, operations and security controls to make sure that they meet the standards outlined in the SOC 2 guidelines. So this is the standard that many people follow that to make sure that we can demonstrate maturity of the operations and security. Um, they are often needed uh, by cloud service providers because 
these days when you have you know in the old days earlier days you know we deploy software run in house so our own operations team will own all the operations and security uh pretty much runtime security for the data and but with cloud services uh you know the uh, company will have to decide to kind of outsource or to offload the work to the cloud and when you have to provide company confidential data to cloud services you need some way to cert- to some certification or some att- attestation to make sure that the cloud vendor is operating at a maturity level that that you need so soft 2 provides fills that gap basically and uh these days when we do vendor assessment i mean to, to be honest the first thing i search for i look for is a soft 2 report because that's another way to show us that hey this is a vendor that somebody third party a certified third party have uh has revealed the operations and security so it gives us a level of conf- uh confidence and uh so that will help that's why it is becoming a popular um requirements for cloud service providers especially for enterprise customers yeah so it sounds like for a lot of types of companies if you're going to be working with any third party vendor essentially making sure that third party vendor has po- passed uh one of these SOC 2 audits is kind of table stakes for uh, indicating that they have reached a certain maturity level and they're following certain security best practices. You mentioned that th- during the audit, they're looking at certain security requirements. Uh, what are some of those requirements that a business needs to satisfy in order to actually pass a secu- uh, SOC 2 audit? This is a good point. Uh, there are many security best practices. To me, it's almost like dictionary. They pretty much pull every single thing that you know of. I would say that, let's say, multi-factor authentication, right? So uh, there are things they want to remind folks, hey, uh, when you for user authentication, let's make sure that the administrators are required to use two-factor authentication. Otherwise, uh, it's one of the common attack factors. And then uh, let's say encryption of data uh, in storage, right? Anything, anywhere sensitive data have to be encrypted, you know, that's there. And then auditing, right? Because last time defense, uh, we have all learned that people can come in and uh, sometimes the best you can do is to audit to know what happened. So they have incorporated that as well into the system. Uh, you know, the full auditing, uh, accountability, meaning knowing who actually did the operation uh, and, you know, having the, we call it SIM systems, a log analysis system to analyze, to look for anomalies. Um, threat detection systems, a lot of good stuff in the, best practices that SOC 2 will look for uh, to in order to satisfy the requirements on of properly handling the sensitive data for the company. And then organization-wise, you're making sure that you have the right operations, you have an HR team with the right job description, right requirements, background checks on people, on employees, um, the right uh, data disaster recovery, meaning something happens to the offices. What can you do with BCP? Uh, how to recover the business operations? A lot of good stuff there. Mm-hmm. And then how does how long does one of these audits actually take? The audit itself can take some time. Uh, usually, let's say, uh, I would say that the active actual field audit is one, two weeks. Uh, a lot of times there's some follow-ups delay, especially if you're the first, first let's say, first, first audit or second audit, right? There'll be some remediation or suggestions to, uh, to follow up to get additional evidence, additional details. Um, I think I, I would say in general, uh, it will take much more time to prepare, but the actual audit to me is like two, three weeks. Then uh, it's about auditor making sure that getting collect information from your policies about how you operate and getting evidence and getting proof and reviewed samples. Um, yep, those are the, the main steps there. Mm-hmm. So what are the what is the sort of the, the typical life cycle that a company is going through? Uh, for like so, uh, essentially there's a preparation phase then they're going to go through an audit and then there might be some back and forth essentially after that uh, yes. maybe some changes that they have to make and yeah. then at some point they're like achieve essentially this level of uh of SOC 2 attestation is that is that sort of the the general flow exactly i mean this is uh like any other you know more like a phd thesis defense uh <laughs> you know this is a, a lot more time spent on preparation uh you know gap analysis preparation make sure that you're ready otherwise it's not very uh, useful make sure that you're ready or you're at least mostly mostly ready right so then we'll start doing the quick gap analysis and readiness check and as you said a field 
audit, actual audit meaning auditor with you, review the policies, review examples, do some testing on the controls. And then as you said, sometimes there's some follow-ups, hey, there's some areas that's not clear. And then, uh, yeah, and then it's about looking at the report and it get a happy report. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, to, to to build on your analogy of the PhD defense, like you should never go to your defense and fail your defense because <laughs> it should never reach that level essentially of, of you uh, presenting something that's not going to pass the defense. You should have prepared ahead of time and given that heads up. And it sounds like for a SOC 2 audit, we're looking at something similar where you shouldn't go into an audit not having done the, the proper homework to prepare yourself for hopefully a passing grade. Absolutely, absolutely. And a lot of artists, they charge extra if you have to do more follow-ups. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, they will not fail you. They will, mm-hmm. re- meaning, you know, unlike school, they'll, I mean, so it just, if you require extensional, additional few months of extra work, then you will pay additional, uh, yeah, cost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there's different types of, uh, like there's SOC 2 type 1, there's SOC type 2 type 2. What is the difference between those different uh, attestations? Thank you. SOC 2 type 1 is a, we call it time-based, uh, a one-time, um, one-time-based, uh, whether you have the controls in place, whether they are functional. So it's more like, do you have it running now? So that's the main test of SOC 2 type 1. All the controls, they make sure that uh, at that time, it is running well. And SOC 2 type 2 is the next level. It means that, hey, can you prove that the controls have been functioning? And have been functioning for the last, let's say, three to twelve months, depending on you know your discussion with the auditors. Um, but usually, you know, it's about last twelve months. Have you been operating consistently uh, at the way you have uh, uh, documented and identified? Right? So, software type two is usually the next level of maturity, making sure that you are running uh, the way you know you have proof that you have been running that you know how you have uh, you know defined it to be running. Yeah. Okay, so type one is uh, basically a, uh, a uh, prerequisite for getting to type two. Is that right? Uh, I would say that uh, a lot of folks, including us, to be honest, we started with type one first, making sure that we have all the controls in place. And a lot of times you want to get a SOC 2 report first. So you start with type one because you need some time to really get to SOC 2. You need enough operations to get to SOC 2, right? So you start to uh, get all the controls in place, make sure that they run well, and then you're ready for type one. Uh, if you are interested, you can go for, for type 1 first, which is what we did. And then once you have type 1 working, of course, very soon after, maybe a few months, six months, nine months, then you want to start initiating a soft 2, less type 2 discussion because now it's running, they're running well. Let's get that level of certification as well. So uh, it is an attestation. Uh, just to want to show that, hey, they are running the way that you have uh, committed to. Mm-hmm. And then there's other types of uh, like security certifications, like ISO 27001. How does that compare to something like SOC 2? Great question. I think both of them are about information security programs and controls. So uh, in fact, there are statistics from the auditors that there are about 40% overlap in terms of controls. Um, so there are many overlaps and there are... There are some differences uh, in some way. ISO 27001 is, we call it a bit more focused on the information security program. So uh, there is a looking at your programs. Are you executing? Are you executing the way you're defined or planned in your program? There's a lot of emphasis on that. And on the other hand, SOC 2 is more about the security controls, making sure that, hey, um, do you have all the controls in place? Do you have the technical controls in place? Um, and making sure that you're operating the controls well. Uh, the more, a bit more on the technical uh, security control side, but the other one, ISO, is a bit more on the program side of things, making sure they run the program uh, well. Mm-hmm. And then what about in comparison to other types of uh, like compliance frameworks that people might be familiar with, like PCI compliance or HIPAA compliance? Is there an overlap between these different types, these different uh, you know, certifications, or uh, are they you know, completely separate ideas? Absolutely. So they are, they all share the same very common technical security controls. Uh, PCI, of course, uh, there are specific requirements on PCI about, you know, truncation rules and, and other rules about, um, how data is handled in different places. But otherwise, in terms of general security controls, such as, uh, auditing, 
monitoring, let's say two-factor authentication, uh, endpoint security, encryption, many of the controls are very, very similar to make sure that we properly uh, control and manage those data. Uh, there are some domain-specific controls or notification uh, requirements. Those will be industry-specific. I mean, those are the differences between the SOC 2, which is a very general, generic uh, guideline versus PCI or HIPAA. And they are more domain-specific ones. Mm -hmm. I see. And then what are... You know, based on your experience, like where what are some of the missteps or challenges that companies typically face when they are pursuing uh, SOC two attestation, and what are your recommendations in terms of trying to overcome those issues? I would say that uh, some folks I've discussed with uh, some mistake or some perhaps oversight is, hey, let me wait until my I have everything super super ready before I even think about SOC two. I would say that from experience, the sooner you start planning the program, having the you know the programs or the, the tools the infrastructure in place, it's just easier to for folks to start operating the way that is needed to comply with the rules. Um, so when the organization is big, I've heard that you know um, uh, soft tool can cost quite a bit of money because they will be using other tools that are just not compatible with different requirements. And uh, by then, you have to change is just either retrofit it or change it costs a lot of money. And uh, a lot of times, the interesting part is the smaller companies, uh, it's going to be much easier to make the right changes to fulfill the requirements by soft tool. If you wait too long, uh, wait too late, uh, it was not, it's not a good, good thing to do. Uh, luckily for us, it's a business requirement from early days, so we started on that very, very early. Hey, it's Sean, host of the show you're listening to. First and foremost, I hope you're enjoying the interview. And if you are, please support the show by subscribing and leaving a positive rating or review. And if you want to keep the conversation going, join our community at skyfo.com slash community. Okay, that's it for me. Now back to the show. I, I think that's like a common recommendation that we've seen as a, a theme across multiple episodes talking about completely, you know, a variety of different things when it comes to security and privacy is like start early and it'll be much easier than if you start really late because uh, essentially you have to not only uh, figure out how to, uh, well, in the, in the case of SOC 2, meet the requirements, but you might have to change essentially the way that you're doing things or operating or even the culture of your company to make sure that people are following whatever the best practices happen to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the things that you will hear, you know, and I've learned from my peers about, hey, let's just start on it early. Let's not wait too late. And that's why we started PCI, HIPAA, SOC 2, all, even including ISO, I mean, all very similar time so that we can get those, get the organization structure right, and the processes defined correctly. And yeah, this is a common thing that people will be mindful of. But uh, in terms of the, in terms of the achieving the SOC 2, I think there are sometimes challenges along the way. Um, there are, you know, as a small company, we also have learned that, hey, when we have to make bigger changes to the company because of maturity, we need a different tool to, for sales. We need different tools for managing, you know, HR, right? So in the early days, early, early days, you just, everything is super small, super easy. When you start having to use more enterprise level tools, sometimes there's a, there are transitions in between. But when we have to do SOC to uh, provide the evidence, uh, it, it is a little bit more more work when you are make, you're making a lot of changes, you know, here and there in the technology stack, in the uh, processes uh, to build the organization, and then at the same time you have to prove to the auditors that hey, I am stable, I am you know, I am all set. Uh, so sometimes it's you know it's still doable, just more work. But I just want to share that you know, so sometimes. Small companies will need to allocate a bit more time when we are going through you know those kind of changes in the company, right? So, uh, but the rest and uh, so, and another key thing that uh, we'll hear a lot of the uh, the veterans will be about uh, making sure that we align with all the stakeholders. That hey, this is an important thing we want to achieve together. That is important. It's it's difficult going to be the one little team trying to get other teams to follow some processes or even provide all the support. Uh, it really depends on the on the team, right? But if all the stakeholders understand, hey, this is needed for the business, for our reputation, 
for our customers, SLAs, then yeah, make sure that all of them are aligned. It will much, be much, much easier to get across, uh, to get through the, the process together. Um, yeah, these are a couple of things that I think would be, uh, I would say that these are, I can attest that these are true and these are super uh, helpful uh, tips from all the uh, you know, veterans mm-hmm. in this area. Yeah. So once you become SOC 2 uh, certified, what, um, how does that impact essentially your vendor selection? Does that mean that any third party vendor that you're going to work with also has to be meeting that same requirement, same, same level of um, you know, compliance? So uh, it's a great question. Uh, I have my own uh, vendor assessment, uh, risk assessment uh, process. I would say that uh, depends on what kind of data we give to them. Uh, there are some vendors, it depends what is vendor, I mean, cloud vendors. So um, I would say that anytime we have our own SLAs about how we handle our customers' data, our users' data, or even our marketing team, our, you know, our, our, you know, our followers' data, right? So, uh, so we have to comply with all the different needs. And because of that, we want to make sure that if we are sharing any data with any third parties, I want to make sure that I know how they handle my data or my users' data and make sure that they follow the same guideline and principle, make sure that I can also address all the needs. So uh, oftentimes you're right. Oftentimes, in most cases, I will check their SOC tool. Uh, without SOC tool, that means I will have to go through my own list of you know, questionnaires right? and to them and even to interview them. Uh, hey, are you doing this? Are you doing that? So a lot of times uh, it's pretty painful. Uh, these days, most companies that we work with, to be honest, uh, they have SOC tool already, even SOC tool type two. Uh, there are some vendors, they don't have anything, but they don't have any risk. And uh, in that case, I can approve those as well. If, Looking at the risk base, looking at what data we're sharing, then we can determine whether we can accept the, uh, the vendors. But there are rules, let's say from HIPAA, that if we share any of those uh, specific data with downstream, with another service provider or you know or consumer, we'll have to you know follow. Let's say in the case of HIPAA, we have to sign a BAA to make sure that they handle the data the same way we'll, we will handle it. So yeah. But uh, but it is mostly true. There are some exceptions, but uh, it is becoming more and more popular. Yes. So in terms of so it sounds like you know essentially you and your team at Skyflow are making sure that the any third party vendor that we're working with is either SOC two has SOC two attestation or they've essentially been able to pass your own audit that they're meeting a certain you know uh, bar in terms of of security is that required to stay SOC 2 uh, uh, certified or is that something that essentially we do because of the fact that we're in a privacy and security space and we have a higher a very high bar when it comes to uh, you know security that is right i mean it's a high bar uh, right now SOC 2 is not a regulatory requirement as far as i know uh, it's not even industry requirement, but it is a often a uh, influence of purchase decision by by users. I mean, when they when anyone evaluate cloud vendors, they will look for some certification. Let's say they might some of them may look for ISO. ISO is a more popular international standard, very similar to SOC two. Uh, US is SOC two very much, but uh, other international users they may look for ISO. So there's no specific one that people look for. And uh, but they look for some one of these well established and comprehensive ones, and uh, they are more like PCI and HIPAA. They are more industry uh, regulations. Um, uh, actually, HIP, uh, yeah, they are more industry related. I mean, HIPAA is a bit more government uh, related when you have to handle health data when um, in certain you know for specific uh corporate entities, but otherwise, soft tool is not a specific government uh, regulations and. There are some industry specific ones, and I really appreciate that because a lot of times the industry is spearheading uh, the requirements. Instead of waiting for government to do something, they actually step out and um, and you know and start the the get the ball rolling. So that's important. I see. Okay, and then given that Skyflow's data privacy vault is uh, SOC two has reached essentially this has gone through the audit is a uh, SOC 2 attestation. What does that mean for customers of Skyflow technology in terms of their ability to reach the same level as attestation? Yeah, so um, when our customers are choosing service providers or platforms, 
then when they have Skyflow, they definitely will have a easier time. Uh, for those controls, they have to prove to their auditors that, hey, my data is safe because I'm using a software compliance um, service provider. So that will help them to address any kind of questions or needs. If they do it themselves, they have to address all the needs. Hey, where's the sensitive data? Uh, how are you encrypting it? Are you doing key rotation? Are you doing backup? All these different things. But when they use a good service provider like Skyflow, we'll take care of those things for them. This is, in fact, one of the value props that we provide to our customers. And, uh, you know, but SOC2 does not have a requirement that all their service providers have to be SOC2 compliant, but you have to prove that, um, you know, you look at all the, review all the requirements, review all the, uh, the operations to make sure that they, they satisfy, um, your, uh, operations needs. So our software can really help that way to help customers to make sure that, yeah, you know, we are getting software, we're getting software, and uh, we address all the software needs so they can comfortably give us the data and we'll handle it for them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so essentially it, it lowers some of the responsibility from their side and maybe speeds up the process uh, yes. in terms of the prep work that they need to get ready for the audit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then Justin, you know, you touched on this a little bit earlier in terms of your advice around starting early uh, as a company, but are there other, you know, pieces of advice that you might give to a business who is just starting to think about the journey to SOC 2? Uh, thank you. This is actually a important point. Um, SOC 2 uh, audit, as well as other audits, they are not like a one-time thing, one-time events. Uh, SOC 2, let's say it's annual uh, report. Um, so it is going to be one of the recurring events that's going to happen throughout the year. And the evidence is going to be throughout the year as well. Meaning, are you doing regular backup testing? Are you doing regular access review, access log reviews? So my suggestion, my recommendation is to have a owner of the compliance effort. Uh, you know, instead of an owner, a clear ownership. Of course, in the beginning, it can be some one just helping out. But uh, having someone to own the effort, to drive the program, to make sure that uh, monthly, quarterly, annually, uh, we hit all the, all the controls, all the needs of different, uh, different areas. I think that's really important. And that same person can really help the company to look at what other relevant industry or other certifications are going to be helpful to the business. And to also make sure that the, the organization is operating at the needed level, complexity and maturity. So having an owner can really help uh, a, a big, a long way. Uh, you can imagine like finance team, there's always a finance group, finance people who are responsible for finance and a compliance is not one of those. Uh, it's going to be, if you simply assign a person help, you know, five hours this week, uh, it's going to be difficult to maintain it long term. So having an owner can really help define the strategy, the right tools to use, um, with the right certification requirements and to track what's new, what's coming as well. Uh, that would be one thing that I would call out for. And then the rest, the, the owner will help drive to make sure that going forward, there'll be a, you know, something that will be taken care of. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, yep. Yeah. So basically start early and have an owner or a directly responsible individual that is, uh, is driving this and, and owns this end to end and, and essentially probably becomes the person, the go-to person when anybody has questions about the state of things and is able to maintain it as well going on beyond even the, the audit phase. Absolutely, absolutely. For especially cloud vendors, I would imagine they need someone who understands the landscape well, understands the overall uh, you know, compliance posture well, so they can answer many questions for the interesting, interested pros prospects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with when we think about things like SOC 2, or you know the ISO certifications or other types of you know compliance frameworks. <clears throat> Some of them are not necessarily strictly required, but maybe there's like a soft requirement where the expectation, if you're selling in the enterprise, that you have certain certain uh, you know certifications under your or, or you've gone through certain audits. But when we look at things like you know manufacturing or or even something like uh, like like a car, like I can't just manufacture cars and start selling them, you know, out of my house, there's certain required inspections from a safety perspective that I have to pay us. Do you think that like our, the sort of the technology or software industry needs to move more towards essentially having like hard requirements that 
uh, before you can launch something and start having people use it, given essentially how many sort of you know data breaches, ransomware attacks, like all these types of attacks that are going on in the world today, do should there be some hard requirements around uh, and, and some controls around our industry? Thank you. I mean, this is a great, great question. So um, I want to share my thoughts. I think that there's a lot of innovation in the software industry. People can write programs, can write games, can write utilities online. And uh, I'm, I believe that maybe not at the software level, but at the kind of data being, being kind of shared or provided and the services involved, right? If there's sensitive data such as my, my, my password, my bank account number, my social security number, which is considered my, my secrets. Um, when I have to share this sensitive data with a, with a software online, um, I would want to make sure that they are operating at the level that I need. And, uh, for us, we are in the, in the field. So we kind of know what to look out for, right? But many consumers, they may not have the expertise to be able to judge a one service from the other one. And, uh, so that's the challenge, right? So I, I, in, from that respect, in that regard, I really love the, the PCI standard, meaning anyone touching card number, you have to comply with this. Otherwise, I'm not doing business with you. It's from Visa and different brands, right? So it's not from government, but the industry is saying that, you know, I need to protect my, my data. Uh, well, my customer's data. So they define it that way. And, um, but certain aspects of data, uh, I think that, uh, depends on data type. We definitely should have protections. So PCI, even the state based, uh, regulations on how to protect privacy data. That's another good example that, hey, sensitive data is involved. I'm somebody stepping in to make sure that someone is responsible to take care of things. So that is one one dimension. I also look at the other dimension would be services. If there's services that's really like super, super critical, I mean, yeah, somebody should make sure that it is running well. I don't care about what kind of data is there, but it should be running well. If there's a software that's connecting, uh, you know, uh, power station with, the, uh, the, the river, you be hydro power. And uh, I don't care what kind of data they're collecting. Maybe nothing personal. Um, I'm still worried about it because it's super important infrastructure. So, uh, there are sensitive ones. Uh, they should be, there should be a bar of quality of service, uh, in that, in that piece of software. I am not aware of those today, but uh, I think those should definitely should be in place, um, by, by government. So, uh, I will see that. These two areas can really be, really benefit from additional, um, additional, let's say supervision, uh, on the, on, on the products or softwares being, uh, being used in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, as we th think about the future as well, like where do you see standards like, like SOC 2 and maybe other security standards going? Yeah. So, you know, one thing that I often, uh, share with my, my colleagues is, uh, first I, I embrace a compliance. Uh, I call them, I think so. I know some folks, you know, may think compliance, Hey, they slow me down, but, uh, I always, I often, oh, no, uh, you know, compare this against like building inspectors. Yeah. They are a bit cumbersome to schedule a meeting with them, but they, their job is to protect us. So compliance is like that to make sure there's a minimum bar, make sure at least there's some minimum set of controls in place. Of course, let's say us, Skyflow, we are in the business of security. So we do a lot more than basic compliance, but compliance is the best we can at least hope for, uh, when there's certification. So we know it hits certain bar. And, um, and so I see the compliance being more and more per pervasive in different parts of our lives. And, uh, I also see improve. I see that let's say software PCI, there's, they continue, continue to revise it because of new technologies new risk areas, right? So there'll be additional rules there, uh, additional controls there and additional cross pollination of good ideas. Uh, there, let's say PCI is ahead of, you know, in terms of a few areas. So software is able to incorporate those into the general programs. The general, um, guidelines usually they are a bit slower, right? Because they have to be vendor neutral, technology neutral. Uh, but what I like about, you know, more industry specific standard is they can be more specific and more advanced. For example, recently I went through a, um, uh, actually working with you, uh, on the Amazon's, uh, you know, uh, security review, right? Amazon was able to give very, very specific requirements to make sure that we comply to standard 
to be honest, is more advanced than regular salt and PCI and HIPAA. But they were able to do it because they they are not worried about being has to be vendor neutral. They're saying that if you want to use us, you have to use these set of technologies. And all the way, I need you to have this configure, that configure. Yes, they make sure that they really leverage the Amazon technology and leverage all the security ones as well, the good ones. Right. So, but uh, but yeah, those vendors can often demand more because they don't need to be super neutral. When you have to look for common denominators, you know, sometimes you cannot be cannot demand as much. So uh, I can see when more technologies are available, many of these technologies we incorporated into the common uh, requirements framework, then uh, we all cannot benefit from it. Yeah, I imagine that's a, a difficult thing from uh, sort of the general fr frameworks because there's going to be a certain level of abstraction. So it's hard to be more specific. Whereas in the you know Amazon circumstance, for example, they can make it really specific to AWS because that's the world that they care about. Uh, so that's kind of the, the, the trade off there. So um, anyway, is, is, is there anything else you want to share before we uh, before we wrap up? I have mentioned the analogy that uh, you know I embrace compliance, and uh, I am really looking forward. I mean, Skyflow we invest a lot in different compliance, uh, you know, the attestation, certification, uh, you name it. Uh, this is one area that we actually work actively work with a few other industry teams on a, on more specific industry guidelines and compliance standards. So this is one area that I strongly believe in this, and will continue to invest heavily in this area as well. Awesome. Well, I think that's a great place to leave it. Uh, Daniel, I want to thank you so much for, for coming back. I think you're a great guest to have as our you know first repeat guest. Hopefully, we'll have some other folks back, of course. And, uh, I, uh, and thanks again for also taking us through everything uh, related to uh, SOC 2, compliance, attestation, and, um, and audits. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks again for having me here.